In a 2010 article on Islamic economics, Osman Bakar suggests an important analogy between medical health and economic health in the context of the traditional sciences of man and nature, which I think are very important for discussion on Hindu and Islamic economics. He notes the big difference between attempting to cure a disease by just treating its symptoms and attempting to cure it by treating its root causes. Traditional Islamic and Hindu medicine are holistic in their view of health and disease, and they focus on the treatment of the root causes of the disease. In contrast, allopathic or modern Western medicine focus on the treatment of symptoms. Likewise, Hindu and Islamic economics are holistic in their view of economic health and ailments, and they're primarily interested in addressing the root causes. In contrast, modern economics and its related financial system are content with finding remedies to cure what seem to be mere symptoms of its recurring disease. Much of that is a quote from the paper. Now, from this perspective, the current environmental economic crisis is not going to be solved by commonly proposed cosmetic solutions that address symptoms rather than root causes of disease. So, for example, causes. Now, I would suggest that from a, an Islamic and Hindu point of view, the root cause of our environmental economic ailments is a mechanistic and materialist worldview that generates scientific, technological, political, economic, and other social structures that do injustice to man and desiccate nature by treating them like resources rather than sacred creations. And it's this fatally flawed world, flawed world view that continuously generates patterns of economic instability and environmental degradation. So if we use uh, the analogy of an iceberg, specific crisis events are merely the tip of the iceberg which are not to be viewed in isolation, but are to be viewed as part of an underlying pattern, which is generated in turn by structures that are in turn generated by an underlying worldview. All of the patterns, structures, and worldview are beneath the surface of the water. So we see only the crisis event. And so it's very important in order to remedy those crisis events that we be able to under, you know, understand that underlying worldview. However, most Hindus and Muslims, along with followers of other religious traditions and all non-believers as well, think that any problems associated with modern science concern only its applications, which may be unethical and not its worldview. But leading Hindu and Muslim scholars of the philosophy of science have challenged this all too common misconception, maintaining that modern science and technology are not spiritually neutral or value free, because every science has its own philosophical presuppositions and worldview. Accordingly, the problems posed by modern science are fundamentally intellectual and cognitive in nature, making it essential to highlight the radical difference between science as organized knowledge, which can refer to any level of reality, and scientism, which claim this, that modern science, defined as empirical or sensory means of knowing the material world, has a monopoly on knowledge. That's two very different things. And unfortunately, in our educational system today, we often conflate science with scientism. We talk about the scientific method, which is based on empirical means of knowing the material world. If that was the only method of knowing, if that was the way to knowledge alone, then anything beyond the sensory or seen world would either be unprovable, unreal, purely fanciful, and so forth. Everything else would be just storytelling. Accordingly, scientism is an ideological construction of modern science that effectively supplants the religious view of the universe. But scientism itself is patently absurd 
since it's impossible to know whether the only way to know anything truly is by using your physical senses, by using your physical senses. All right, so scientism is internally inconsistent because it asserts that empirical or sensory means of knowing the material world has a monopoly on knowledge, but it's impossible to know whether the only way to know anything truly is by using your physical senses, by using your physical senses. It would be, but unfortunately the standard approach to at least Islamic economics, and, uh, and I think this largely applies to Hindu economics as well, in most eminent studies and publications, attempt to combine Hindu and Islamic economic law with modern science, technology, and mainstream economic theory, despite the fact that religious ethics cannot cohabit with a view of the order of nature that radically denies the very premises of religion and that claims for itself a monopoly of the knowledge of the order of nature. In fact, Islamic and Hindu economics are not reducible to a combination of modern economic theories and Hindu and Islamic economic laws any more than Hindu and Islamic medicine are reducible to a distorted combination of conventional allopathic medicine with elements of Hindu and Muslim medical practice and ethics. So to return to our iceberg analogy, one cannot recognize the underlying patterns, structures, and worldview showing only in the tip without recognizing the need for and regaining an understanding of the teachings of the Islamic and Hindu or any other holistic intellectual heritage that could rectify these underlying flaws. Now, modern economic theory, however, t denies the need for such a drastic restoration based on the view that, quote, modern society is made up of two spheres. One is an economic sphere of individual initiative and interaction governed by impersonal laws that assure a beneficent outcome by the pursuit of self-interest. And two, the rest of social life, including political, religious, and moral interactions that require the conscious balancing of self-interest with social considerations. Now this argument, unquote, this argument is sometimes called the separate domain argument, namely that economics is in that separate domain in which the motivations of the actors in the economy, whether they're ethical or not, have nothing to do whether a market economy generates beneficent outcomes because these free market economic structures are allegedly amoral as opposed to being immoral. Now, Marxist economic theory takes a different position regarding this relationship between ethics, economics, and the prevailing modern worldview, and asserts the need for and relevance of ethics and cooperation in the economic domain. And so, we have four possible combinations regarding the relationship between ethics, economics, sustainability, and worldview. One, the separate domain claim that the separation between ethics and economics based on a mechanical, mechanistic, and materialistic worldview is socio-economically and environmentally sustainable. Two, the Marxist claim that ethics and economics can be linked under communism for equilibrium and sustainability based on the same worldview that's mechanistic and materialistic. Three, the religious claim that ethics must be linked to economics for sustainability based on a holistic worldview and therefore the separate domain argument is false. And four, the claim that industrial communism cannot integrate ethics and economics and is likewise unjust and unsustainable. Now, from an Islamic or Hindu point of view, it's going to take that positions three and four, namely that a holistic worldview is necessary for sustainability, and that therefore the claims of 
mainstream economic theory in, for example, West, the West uh, regarding the separate domain argument is false, and that the Marx claim to integrate ethics and economics is likewise false, and therefore it's unsustainable. And so we have, uh, you could imagine a table, a two by two table that perhaps we'll put up uh, during our lecture with the relevance of ethics to economics, yes, no, and sustainability, uh, yes, no, and then you get four possible combinations and uh, where Islamic economics and Hindu economic theory would place uh, traditional versus uh, modern economic structures, whether they're uh, industrial or post-industrial capitalism or communism. And so what we what would attempt to do in this talk is to clarify the intimate but currently neglected connection between the Islamic and Hindu cosmological sciences and Islamic and Hindu thought. And so uh, what we would seek to do is first examine how each of the tradition's holistic sciences of man and nature integrate ethics and economics in their traditional economies and how that leads to environmental uh, sustainability. And then secondly, examine how the secular sciences of man and nature divorce ethics and economics in this mechanistic and materialistic worldview and the resultant production and exchange processes that efface the moral limits of markets uh, on one hand or in industrial capitalism or are extremely oppressive under industrial communism and lead to the socioeconomic instability and environmental crisis now threatening human survival. Yes. Uh, well, you know, it's it's really it's really connecting this uh, the principle of tawhid, which informs our worldview, to the structures which generate the patterns which generate specific events. Yep. And so Islamic economic theory would analyze both uh, structures that are based on Tawheed and structures that are not based on Tawheed and examine the consequences of that. And so the first part of the paper will focus on the Islamic and Hindu economic structures and then show how that leads to environmental equilibrium. And then the second part of the paper will show how the opposite occurs when you, uh, with the secularization of the, that uh, divorce between philosophy and theology and, and, and so forth. Uh, Fuller? Um, maybe you can uh, talk a little about where the Muslim economic theory originates from. You know? All right. Now, the origin of Islamic economics is Tawheed, or the doctrine of unity within Islam. All Muslims agree on the doctrine of Tawheed. The only debate occurs on what are the consequences of Tawheed. And so if we return to the iceberg analogy that we discussed earlier, Tawheed would be the base. That would be the worldview. And then drawing the consequences of Tawheed for our scientific, technological, political, economic, social, and other structures would be the second. Um, I'll, I'll tell the story of the uh, young man who was running the market before the Battle of Badr. And... Uh, uh, somebody said that, you know, they wished that he would join uh, the battle and the Prophet them said that, you know, because the young man that um, to struggle for a living is tantamount to defending the faith. And so therefore uh, work striving to the, for our livelihood is a type of uh, jihad and everything is sacred uh, and that uh, Islamic law um, is uh, pertains to the outside conditions of fulfilling the work, but um, the internal dimension is through the guilds 
is uh, what makes that um, particularly important. Or if you prefer, I could just focus on the story of, for example, the way the guilds, the way that they would uh, say prayers and so forth and fast and connect their silsila back to the prophet or this, you know, the story of Titus Burkhart. Actually, you know what? That would be the best. <laughs> Let me quote that story of the uh, comb maker oh, in yes. Fez yes, yes. who, uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just read this from uh, Titus Burkhart. Uh, Please do. Thank you so much. So to illustrate the difference between an Islam economy and a modern economy, I'd like to quote a story from Titus Burkhart, which is a masterful and penetrating summation of the current situation of traditional craftsmen still left in the Islamic world, and I think the same would apply to the Hindu world. He says, quote, I knew a comb maker who worked in the street of his guild. He was called Abdulaziz and always wore a black jalaba, the loose hooded garment with sleeves, and a white turban with a lithem, the fail vase, face veil. Let me start again. Uh, I knew a comb maker who worked in the street of his guild. He was called Abdelatis and always wore a black jalaba, the loose hooded garment with sleeves, and a white turban with a lithem, the face veil, which surrounded his somewhat severe features. He obtained the horn for his combs from ox skulls, which he bought from butchers. He dried the horn skulls at a rented place, removed the horns, opened them lengthwise, and straightened them over a fire, a procedure that had to be done with the greatest care, lest they should break. From this raw material, he cut combs and turned boxes for antimony, used as an eye decoration on a simple lathe. This he did by manipulating with his left hand a bow which, wrapped around a spindle, caused the and he held the knife, and with his foot he pushed against the counterweight. As he worked, he would sing Quranic surahs in a humming tone. I learned that, as a result of an eye disease which is common in Africa, he was already half blind and that, in view of long practice, he was able to feel his work rather than see it. One day he complained to me that the importation of plastic combs was diminishing his business. Quote, it is not only a pity that today, solely on account of price, poor quality combs from a factory are being preferred to much more durable horn combs, he said. Quote, it is also senseless that people should stand by a machine and mindlessly repeat the same movement, while an old craft like mine falls into oblivion. My work may seem crude to you, but it harbors a subtle meaning which cannot be explained in words. I myself acquired it only after many long years, and even if I wanted to, I could not automatically pass it on to my son if he himself did not wish to acquire it. And I think he would rather take up another occupation. This craft can be traced back from apprentice to master until one reaches, say, Seth, the son of Adam. It is he who first taught it to men. And what a prophet brings, for Seth was a prophet, must clearly have a special purpose, both outwardly and inwardly. I gradually came to understand that there is nothing more fortuitous about this craft, that each movement and each procedure is the bearer of an element of wisdom. But not everyone can understand this. But even if one does not know this, it is still stupid and reprehensible to rob men of the inheritance of prophets and to put them in front of a machine where Day in and day out, they must perform a meaningless task." Unquote. Of the origin of Islamic economics is obviously Tawheed, as articulated in Qur'an and Hadith. And that forms, in a sense, the worldview around which 
all of the other scientific, technological, uh, political, economic, and other social structures of Islam emanate. And those structures in turn generate the patterns which generate the specific events. And so from this point of view, Hindu and Islamic economics are applied ethics, but understood broadly as applying both individually and structurally, which also acknowledge the aesthetic aspect of work and spell out the consequences of violating those spiritual, ethical, and aesthetic principles in our economic affairs. So in other words, oftentimes when we think of applied ethics, we think of it as an individual thing, rather than dealing with the collective structures and those collective choices to determine the structures within which we will all live. And therefore, if ethical principles at both the individual and structural level are necessary for socioeconomic and environmental equilibrium, then ignoring or diverging from those principles makes no sense and subverts and destroys any hope of a just, harmonious, efficient, and environmentally sustainable economy. And so Islamic and Hindu economics not only study Islamic and Hindu economies, they also study modern industrial and post-industrial capitalism as well as communism. And so it is not correct to say that Islamic economics is simply normative for Muslims and is not descriptive of non-Islamic economies. That is false. And so it's very important to understand that Islamic economics is a comprehensive discipline. It represents an alternative, a complete and holistic alternative to modern economic theory and practice uh, and applies to the aesthetic aspect of work, not simply what we do, but also what we make in addressing those uh, uh, the productive uh, processes, not only our exchange processes.